you want fun? Well, I'll show you four. Super Mario 64, the game we're all too familiar with by now. Whether you're resisting pressing the A button or hunting down Mario's long lost brother, this game will always be encompassed in a strange, nostalgic shroud of mystery for a great deal of us. But we all know why we've gathered here today. We're all here for a common goal. Much like you, my mom used to read me the Super Mario 64 Mysteries Guide before bed. Don't let the time discrepancy distract you. While many people had pleasant dreams throughout their youth, there were plenty of us haunted by dreams of getting eaten by Bubba or even Dory. Even when we didn't want to think about it, Super Mario 64 simply called us back time and time again, and that connection still exists with us today. So pull up a chair, light yourself a candle, and prepare for a journey into the depths of the haunted tales of Super Mario 64. July 29th, 1995 is where our adventure begins today. Prior to Super Mario 64's launch, there was a particular build that became extremely noteworthy in the Mario 64 mythos. Extremely credible sources claim that this build may have not even been related to Mario at all, but it was the special properties of this build that made it extremely interesting. By now you've probably heard about how every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized. I mean, it isn't recommended that you go searching about this or the build we're talking about, but this is a safe space. An anonymous commenter outlines what this personalization exactly means. It refers to experimental AI that has the ability to alter the game and tailor the game to be appealing to you on a subconscious level. They say this is the reason why if we were to play someone else's Super Mario 64, it would just feel slightly off. In closing, it's stated that Super Mario 64 is, at its core, an insidious and evil work of human creation. Now, let this sink in for a second. Within this video, we're going to be jumping back and forth from creepypasta land to real world counterparts. So of course, keep all this in mind and suspend disbelief. Often paired with a strange build and personalization concept is what people call the Wario Apparition. Think of how badly we wanted to have Luigi in Super Mario 64. Or heck, while Luigi in Super Mario 64 DS for some of you. The collective subconscious thought process of these wishes are what brought Wario to life. However, he was incomplete. A shell of what he should be. The haunted hallway leading up to Dire Dire Docks is where Wario can be encountered, and should he manifest himself in front of you, it's highly recommended that you turn off your console immediately, surround yourself in a circle of salt, and then burn the game. I mean, the instructions are a bit weird because it'd be hard to like light the game on fire when you're constrained to a circle of salt, but I digress. Chances are you won't have memories of it either because Wario will have devoured them. Okay, time to turn on the lights. Now that we have all that covered, let's actually talk about some things that I truly find interesting about all of this. If you haven't already, I highly recommend checking out the Mario 64 Conspiracy Iceberg. There's a lot of amazing things to check out on it, and it's definitely worth giving it a gander. But now I want to parallel some things to the real world, because this whole personalized thing, in some strange ways, actually isn't too far off in some regards, or at least for some people back in the 90s. Now I know that may sound far-fetched, but hear me out. First and foremost, let's talk about the Wario Apparition. Without the creepy lens overshadowing it, apparently at E3 in 1996, Wario's face was featured within a session basically floating above the second Bowser level entrance. Taken out of context, his dialogue can be pretty creepy on its own though. You think this is fun? Wario will show you fun. During the session, it seems Wario was utilized as a bridge before the live demonstration for the Nintendo 64 console. But in the creepypasta land, this is where this Wario ghost is sourced from. And I'll be honest, I never saw this presentation at all. So it's understandable that this face caused quite a ruckus as it started to sweep across the internet again in present day. It's super interesting though because Mario Teaches Typing 2 was only released a year or so after this. I imagine they just repurposed this Wario concept as Mario since he has many similar talking segments in the game. Or perhaps Mario Teaches Typing 2 was already in development so they didn't bother reinventing the wheel and simply used this to build this 3D Wario. It makes you wonder which came first. As for beta builds of the game, there's of course a lot of information out there. And honestly, there are better resources than I to document these changes and what they truly contained. But this is when I want to turn back to the aspect of personalization. Now, not from the AI point of view, but from a manipulation point of view. If you've watched this channel, you know I've covered all sorts of weird gaming mysteries. I feel like the pinnacle of gaming mysteries took place prior to the year 2000, mainly because everything was mostly word of mouth, or you'd have to head over to your friend's house to look around the internet. But even then, very few records of stuff actually existed. So think about the concept about how rumors and mysteries start. You have Ella's Real 2401. For me, a big one was the ghoul medal of Big Boo's Haunt. There were some that I found in games like Bomberman 64 that I hadn't even seen online, but we could only really show or tell our friends. 
So what if he had a game cartridge that was truly different from someone else? And you know, we joke about this whole personalization thing, but I really think some rumors back in the day could have been influenced by personalized or more so altered cartridges. Again, hear me out before jumping down to the comments. So let's rewind back to the late 90s and even the very early 2000s. Mystery documenting websites were starting to pop up and document strange things within games. People were also starting to experiment with altering the read aspects of games by physically messing with cartridges, by either tilting it or removing it while the game was running. Of course, when people heard about stop and swap mechanics, I feel like this experimentation was only amplified. Tilting a cartridge could make a game freak out, like this wrestling game for example. But in certain games, you could use this glitched state to perform actions you normally would not be able to do, like walk through doors or objects blocking your path. To someone completely unaware, cartridge tilted gameplay looks like something out of a creepypasta. Animations of body are askew, the music is sharp and painful, etc. But this concept is really only the beginning, because alongside these tilting mechanics, people began taking it to the next level, and they started cartridge tilting while utilizing a game shark. And this is where things get interesting. One story that comes to mind was related to Ocarina of Time. People apparently were utilizing Game Shark codes to change the color of Link's tunic. But one case in particular that was reported on a ways back talked about how someone removing the game while the Game Shark was running left some weird effects. Their save file was fried, of course, but booting the game back up without the Game Shark still presented them with a black tunic. Now, the game file itself is read only memory, so it can't be altered this way, but it's possible residual information existed in the SRAM, which may have latched onto these changes. I'm no expert though, but I've seen similar things happen when speedrunners are playing and manipulating data by having the bottle on the B button. I have no idea if this would persist forever, but I've also read similar cases online where certain save file bugs can persist even if a save is clear through the in-game method. Again, not an expert, can't comment on the validity. Perhaps some of you in the comments could though. I just find this case super weird because it wasn't anything game-breaking or something you perceive as misleading. It's just that the altered color persisted and they documented it. It's not like they were trying to dupe kids into accessing the Sky Temple or something. So, for the sake of it, let's push forward under the assumption it's true for the time being. So alongside the lack of internet for some of us, renting games was a super big thing. And because cartridge tilting was deemed to be dangerous, some people who partook in the practice would utilize a rented game out of fear that they would ruin their own. I can imagine a really interesting situation where someone screws up their cartridge with minor things, like reassign color values if it's truly possible, and then returning it to the rental store. Some other random kid rents the game and then doesn't understand why something looks weird, or why all the levels are unlocked in another game despite the save file being new. I can't even imagine if we had the tools of today back when 90s era rental stores were open. Can you imagine someone renting Mario 64, but it was an N64 repro with a creepypasta hack written to it? If I ever find a time machine, that's going to be my mission in life. Scaring some kid in 1996 by having Wario chase him out of Princess Peach's basement. The first 20% of the game would be normal, so the game stores could playtest it upon return. But the true horror starts after Bowser 1 is cleared. I mean, it's evil, but it would have been the ultimate way to introduce a cursed cartridge. Seeing everything related to this July 29th, 1995 build of Super Mario 64, from the creepy AI personalization to the floating Wario head really makes me wish that was possible. I absolutely love everything about the seemingly ARG that's been emerging over the past month because it's been equally creepy but also nostalgic. I have no idea what's coming next, as people continue to feed aspects into this conspiracy theory every week. It's this blind navigation and anticipation that makes this whole concept really awesome and eerie. I dare to say a modern day Ella's Real extension, at least from the perspective of scavenging for information and lore. The mystery of a cursed build and a trapped soul. Wario's watching you. So, be careful. And with that, thanks for watching guys and gals, and don't go into the castle alone. Cheers. You gotta be cool crazy. You want fun? Wario show you fun.